and superstructure is automatically strong. So if one can learn such issues from a person who is teaching in NSSU Bangalore, Dr. A. Nagaratna, Associate Professor of Law, Coordinator, Advanced uh, Center on Research, Development and Training Cyber Law. Since she has been teaching the students, coupled with the fact that she has attended a lot of webinars and has been a resource person on the webinars and seminars, we requested her to take a topic on which we are discussing a lot of issues nowadays, which we see is widely covered in the print as well as media, hacking and liability under law. And even otherwise, we always keep on reading and also discussing that they will, they are, my account has been hacked with a lot of times since we are on the social media, we see it, we always find a request coming and next day a person posting a message to the effect that my account has been hacked, kindly do not accept the request. And we also knew that one of the judges received a message and he transferred without verifying the facts, the amount to the another colleague of his, which came a lot of into the news. And is the hacking simpliciter or there are certain liabilities which are automatically flowing if you hack an account? These are the areas where we requested Dr. A. Nagaratna to traverse us to the journey as to how it all is and what are the liabilities arising out of it under the law. Without taking much time, I would request Dr. Nagaratna, uh, who has acceded to our request to share her knowledge. And I would say the participants will be glad enough to grab with both hands. Otherwise, such knowledge sharing is restricted to the university where the professor is teaching. But the, another important facet which has come forth during these testing times is that we can ask any resource person in any nook or corner of the world to share the knowledge. And here we are to have the knowledge from such a resource person. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Okay, just let me share the screen. That's a bit loud. A very good afternoon, uh, and uh, um, I'm happy to be here talking about an extremely important issue, and that's about hacking and how the law looks at this particular aspect. Uh, so, as uh, uh, Vikas uh, was saying, so uh, today this technology has given us so much of advantage that you can connect with people across the world. So much so that even events like this, online sharing of knowledge, you know, these interactions can also happen only because of this nature of technology. So the ICT technology or the cyber technology helps us in getting access to people, access to communication, access to information. That's also the reason why we call today's uh, era as an information era or information age. At the same time, this can also provide access to the data, uh, uh, you know, be it in form of information or in form of personally identifiable information. And also sometimes data which is supposed to be confidential in nature, data which is sensitive in nature. So they by raising questions of cyber security, questions of privacy, etc. So therefore, on one hand, though this technology is an extremely advantageous one, it has also raised concerns of security, privacy, and thereby it shows that this technology can also be abused if it is not like properly regulated. And therefore, it is a concern for law, and law needs to address this concern in two manners. So, uh, one, by way of promoting the usage of this technology. Second is by way of regulating the abuse of this technology. Now, hacking um, is one of the form of uh, cybercrime, a very commonly committed form of cybercrime, and recognized as a common form of cybercrime by almost every legal system, including Indian legal system, that is Indian Information Technology Act. Uh, though it is recognized as a crime, it raises a lot of questions, and I will be focusing on those questions that have uh, raised concerns about uh, the uh, legal liability. Should it even be imposed? If so, should it be uh, in form of civil liability or criminal liability? Now, what if that hacker is the one who is only trying to show vulnerability of a system? Or what if that hacker is actually using his skill to help somebody else? So these are some of the questions that gets uh, 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 related to the theme that we discussed about. Uh, hacking in general is, this, is uh, defined as an unauthorized access or intrusion into a computer or a computer network. So basically the whole uh, aspect here is that there is an entry that the hacker gains into 
in terms of the system or the computer network and this entry is unauthorized one it is without the consent of the owner or owner or the person who is legally authorized to provide such consent um, that is in relation to the computer so basically it's the element of consent which matters when you talk about legal liability of a hacker now the motive of the hacker can be anything so he can just hack and just gain access to a system link the system or he can intrude into the system stay there watch the activities associated with that particular cyberspace or the electronic device he can also in uh, uh, steal the data that is vital data from that system that has gained illegal access into or he can even later misuse this data so it all depends on what actually the hacker does and this is something that needs to be taken care of before we discuss about the extent of liability power to make up uh, the offense under the substantive law so what matters is that this person has gained access without the consent uh so in fact like we would have also heard about terms like cracker hacker and also would this matter now for the law not much of a relevance now but then initially when the term hacking was or hacker or uh, you know these terms were becoming popular hacker was referred to it was used as a term with reference to a person who had skill and the proficiency in gaining access into computers and also in operating upon the computer operating systems working upon the computer operating systems and he was the one who also carried with him the skill to even change these codes or change these operating systems etc so uh, initially they put the term had no relevance when it comes to say the question of imposing liability and however uh, since the motive could be anything so it could also be illegal uh so therefore that was the reason as to why the law had to take this as a very serious concern and recognize this as a uh, cyber crime so otherwise motive as i said earlier could vary from case to case and from person to person sometimes the hacker might be using his skill of hacking only to solve problem of a software company nowadays in fact we see that with respect to say ethical hackers who try to hack the systems belonging to uh, industries or governments Uh, or like even some sectors like banking sectors so over here their motive may only be to show the vulnerability of the system so since they wouldn't intend to steal any system or uh, use that you know uh, steal any data from the system or they wouldn't want to misuse this data for any fraudulent activity imposing liability upon them may not be a justifiable one while on the other hand a person can recruit a hacker only to get confidential information from another person for example companies might do this so they can uh, you know employ hackers so as to get confidential information from another rival company so therefore the purpose for which this hacking is committed matters a lot when it comes to uh, uh, deciding about the question of liability otherwise a uh, hacker as of now would include anyone who gains access into a computer computer system computer network but in earlier days when the term cracker was used it was with reference to somebody who could also access the password protected files or the folders or the contents of the computer so beyond hacking you would also be the one who would gain access into the contents of the computers which are password protected or encrypted but anyways nowadays we use the two terms uh, and almost interchangeably so it hardly matters when it comes to hacking typically there are various ways through which hacking can take place it can be as simple as just you know uh, gaining access into a system that you have not taken the security in terms of having a password protection etc maybe you've just left your computer unattended so i gain access into the folders on your computer so that is also hacking as per the currently available legal provision otherwise it can also include using hacking tools so there are a lot of techniques and tools available technically i can also use that to gain access into a system so therefore the manner in which a person gains access into a system varies from again case to case so there are a lot of tools that are available in fact a lot of um, uh, you know online uh, in fact like websites are also there where such hacking tools are available uh so therefore techniques can be any just to name a few uh, manner like methods or techniques uh, you know through which a hacker can gain access into a system are this first one is 
he can check for vulnerability that is there in a computer. So suppose your system has some vulnerability, some weakness. So maybe it's not, you know, uh, antivirus, uh, you know, uh, you don't have an updated antivirus program. It's not virus protected. Or you don't have like, you know, updated patches, you know, that you have enabled your system upon. So these are the vulnerabilities that he can look for in order to gain access into a system. As I said earlier, sometimes it's, it, it doesn't even require this. The fact that you've not like restricted access by others itself is enough for hackers to gain access into your system. So that's the reason why passwords and encryption methods are considered to be an extremely important modes of restricting access by uh, uh, illegal intruders. The second way can be by way of gaining uh, you know, access to your password. So maybe I can use again, online available tools to crack your password, to guess your password, or otherwise, you know, sometimes, you know, the password is such that somebody can easily guess. And most of us know that most of us do, you know, uh, keep some passwords which can be easily, you know, guessed by another person. Maybe, for example, it can be in relation to your, say, birth date or extremely important, you know, date or year of your life. So things like this. So sometimes for an intelligent hacker, he will have to just, you know, know about your, you know, some of your personal information with which he can guess the password. So therefore, again, over here, the technique need not always be technical in nature, but it can be any. And through this technique, if I gain access to your password credentials, I can gain access into your system. Then the other mode would be just to get access into the data which is in transition. So maybe you're communicating that is through an online platform to another person, and I capture the data in the course of that online communication. And if that captured data allows me access into a system, so that's also another way of hacking. So therefore, there are many methods through which hackers can gain access into a system. And who are the usual uh, you know, targets of hackers? It can be any, because the general assumption is that if I'm not uh, I know, uh, the one who is using my computer for important, uh, say, assignments or projects, I may not be the victim of hacking, but that's uh, not true, because the target of a hacker can be any. It can include a government agency, uh, um, or it can also include a private institution, it can include an academic institution, it can include celebrities, it can even include, uh, say, common people. Now, your question can be as to why are common people victims of uh, hacking? So sometimes maybe I'm not interested in your portfolio, I'm not interested in the data that you, uh, you know, might have, but maybe I would just want to take control of your system so that I use your system as a tool to further hack somebody else's computer so that I can misguide the investigation. So therefore, anyone can be a potential victim. Otherwise, today, in fact, personal data is extremely important. So somebody who is interested in knowing about my personal information can also be interested in hacking my system or getting you know, illegal access to my personal information. So therefore, victims can be any, and it is very, very hard to profile a victim. Similar is also the concern when it comes to the accused. So who is the hacker? Who is the accused? You know, who is that wrongdoer who uses or misuses his hacking skill? It can again be any. It can be industries recruiting hackers. It can be an individual. It again can be any individual. It's not necessary that he should be highly educated or technically do good and all because hacking is a term is comprehensive enough to include any or every form of gaining illegal access into a computer, computer system, computer network. So therefore, it's difficult to profile both the accused as well as victim when it comes to hacking as a crime. Again, motive can vary from case to case. It can just be to annoy a person or it can just be to gain access to confidential information. It can be to actually uh, show that your system is not secured. It can be to later misuse the confidential information I and you know, gain access to misuse in the sense I might use it for fraudulent purpose, I might use it for defacement, I might offer a particular website, I might use it for you know, any other illegal purpose. So therefore, motive of the hacker varies from case to case and becomes extremely important when you, you know, uh, uh, have to decide about the extent of liability to be imposed under the law. Sometimes motive is also something to do with, say, uh, helping a law enforcement agency, in the course of investigation or other legal process, including criminal process. So therefore, it is essential to see the motive and accordingly decide the nature of liability under the law. Now, in uh, the uh, 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 area beyond the law framework, so hackers refer themselves you know, to, say, ethical hackers. So we've heard about this term. At the same time, so a lot of uh, writings do refer to three types of hackers. So, uh, for example, uh, some refer to uh, a particular set of hackers as 
black hat hackers, some are referred to as gray hat hackers, some are referred to as white hat hackers. So what does this mean? So if you see from the law perspective, so again, this has to do with the motive. So therefore, it is of relevance to uh, the uh, uh, law. So a uh, white hat hacker is the one who is actually an ethical hacker whose whole object is to just hack a system so that he is able to show vulnerability in a system. So as I was mentioning earlier, a lot of times you have like ethical hackers hacking into the systems that belongs to banks or other agencies. So here their motive is only to show you that your system is vulnerable. Right. Then secondly, it can also be with, uh, say, partially good motive and partially a motive which deserves some sort of sanction. So that is where I hack a system uh, 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 to show the vulnerability, but since it's not, it's not with the consent, so it might invite some extent of liability. So uh, that is usually referred to as gray hat hackers, while completely somebody who is exempt from liability would be the one who does it under the authority of the law, under the order of law. For example, suppose a police hacks into a system, you know, in the course of investigating a particular case, you know, while searching for evidences, or he avails the service of another hacker to do this task. So that hacker or the police uh, directly hacking, so that kind of a case can come under white hat hacker, while the one who does it to show vulnerability can fall under gray hat hacker category. Black hat hacker category would include those hackers who commit a hacking with some illegal intention, maybe to illegally gain access to some sensitive information, etc. Today we also hear about another term called as hacktivism. So what does this mean? Using hacking as a method to actually you know, pass on some social or political message. So basically, this is a form of activism with the use of uh, with the use of ICT technology. So many uh, uh, times you've seen how activism is used as a message is used as a mode through uh, which activism takes place on social media. Uh, again, when the question of liability comes, so what happens after hacking also matters. So sometimes hackers might deface websites. So this is something that we've seen with respect to a lot of government-based websites. Sometimes I can hack and deny access into that particular system by other genuine users. So this is you know, a form of DOS attack or denial of service attack. And sometimes terrorists might use this particular mode uh, to, um, you know, uh, um, uh, affect the government-based you know, websites or the systems. Sometimes it can also lead to data theft. So therefore, depending upon what happens after ha hacking, you know, matters a lot when it comes to imposing liability. We'll see all these through legal provisions in a while, but just before that, the number of hacking has been increasing day by day. So on slide, you can see how the incidences have increased over the years. So this is based on the statistics that were presented uh, you know, before uh, the uh, uh, Lok Sabha by concerned minister. Similar are also uh, the reflections that you get when you see the reports that comes uh, through other sources, including NCRB recent data, has also indicated an increase in the number of cyber crimes that is getting committed, including hacking you know, as a form of cyber crime. Uh, in addition to these two sources, so we can also get some um, information about the number of cyber attacks that are happening to certain websites, computer emergency response team of India also often releases reports which talks about number of cyber attacks happening across the country, including hacking. Uh, and there have been a lot of incidences of like hacking which has affected uh, the uh, national security. So I can name many incidences, but I'm sure we keep you know hearing about this, reading about this through various other sources of information, including media. So let's come to the legal aspect since we're talking about the legal liability. It was in the year 2000 that the Indian Information Technology Act was passed. And all of us do, I'm sure, know that this act was passed mainly to encourage, promote, legally recognize e-commerce and e-governance. So the focus was not much on regulating crimes or cyber crimes. However, we did have a provision in the 2000 enactment itself which spoke about hacking. But the way they defined hacking was in a very narrower sense. So the law was also not very clear. It lacked a certainty. In the year 2008, we amended the Information Technology Act. So now what we have is a provision that underwent amendment in the year 2008. Uh, 2008 amendment, in fact, uh, uh, you know, helps us to understand that there's a shift in the focus when it comes to the legal approach in terms of, uh, say, uh, checking the abuse of ICT technologies. So now the focus is also on, apart from promoting e-commerce and e-governance, the focus is also on regulating cyber crimes. 
the section under which hacking can be dealt with you know in terms of imposing criminal liability section 66 but however if you look at section 66 it refers to another section and that is section 43 so let's just go through the provision so section 66 says if any person dishonestly or fraudulently does any act referred to in section 43, he can be subjected to criminal liability and extent of punishment and all is laid down. So if an offense which is covered under 43 is committed with a dishonest or a fraudulent intention, it becomes a criminal offense under 66. This would mean that hacking is recognized both as a civil offense as well as as a criminal offense under IT Act. So if you want to file a civil case, you will have to use section 43. If you want to file a criminal case, you'll have to use section 66. So it's the same civil offense is criminalized provided requisite mentria is you know, uh, proved in a case. So that is the mentria in form of dishonesty or fraud in it. The statutory explanation to this particular section says that the term dishonesty and fraudulently will carry the same meaning that's assigned to it under IPC. So which means the accused should have intention to commit fraud or intention to deceive or his act should lead to wrongful loss or wrongful gain. So the same interpretation that's been given to the terms, these terms and IPC holds good for this also. So that's important for us to understand uh, the scope of this provision because, you know, I might have accidentally gained access into your email account. You know, probably we are sharing a computer in an office setup. So maybe you left your email account, you know, say unsecure. And while trying to log into my email account, if I access your email account, I can't be held liable, at least under 66, because this lacks dishonestly and fraudulently intention. So that is one safeguard. So I always see that this requisite mens rea in form of dishonestly and fraudulently is the you know, safeguard that we might get you know, uh, under this provision, because otherwise the provision is extremely widely worded. Uh, let's look at section 43 so that we better understand what's been criminalized uh, whether it is in the name of hacking or otherwise. Uh, Section 43, which is a civil liability imposing provision, says that if a person with the, without the permission of the owner or any other person who's in charge of a computer, computer system, computer networks, if you notice, the terms they use are extremely wider terms, thereby also widening the scope of the provision. They use the word computer, computer system, computer network, and without the uh, concerned device, owner or officer in charge of that device without his permission if I you know, gain access into that system. So it's an offense under clause A because it is clause A without the permission of so-and-so person. If you access or secure access to such system, it's an offense. So instead of like referring to the term hacking, so they rather give a definition which in fact includes offenses like hacking. It's important to note that they use two words, access, and accesses and secures access. So accesses can be with reference to direct act of hacking your system. Securing access can be through another person or through a hacking kind of a tool or a device. So it can also be like indirectly gaining access into your system. Right? Uh, this just doesn't stop here. So it depends on what I do once I hack the system. After hacking the system, if I download the data, steal the data, so clause B, gets attracted because it says whoever downloads, copies, extracts any data from a computer, computer system, computer network. So he commits an offense under clause B. So therefore, hacking can be a means through which you know, the end I've achieved is you know, data stealing. So if it is of such an offense, it gets covered under clause A and B. Sometimes somebody can gain access into a system through malware. So that is taken care of under clause C. So I introduce a malware and through that I gain access into your system or the files on your system, say for example, ransomware attacks, etc., where I encrypt your data, etc. So again, what I'm trying to say is hacking per se is also criminalized. And depending upon what is the consequence of such hacking, hacking. So after hacking, what I do? So depending upon what exactly takes place thereafter, we can apply the other clauses as well. Uh, then section 43 talks about say damaging the contents of the computer. So I hack your computer, I delete your files, I delete the data on your files, so clause D gets attracted. I hack your computer and say manipulate its programs, etc., in such a manner that the computer gets disrupted, it is no more functional, or I deny your access into your computer. You know, after hacking, I probably put a password because of that, you're unable to gain access into your own you know, uh, files that are there on the computer. So then clause E as well as F will apply.
or i you know help another person to gain access into a computer computer system computer network basically an offense of abetment is also covered under clause g uh so then uh, if at all i uh, you know hack and then change a program in such a manner that somebody else gets you know benefit of it in a manner in which like you know a is actually availing a service and b gets charged for it and for this particular thing i say had the system and manipulated the programs in the system or the content in the system clause h can get you know attracted so this usually happens in relation to atm frauds and also where maybe you know i am using your atm card or debit card credentials or credit card credentials and making online purchases and you're getting the bills for it uh, so and for this i have used hacking as a mode or internet time theft where again i hack into your internet service and uh you know uh, divert the services towards my device so all of these can get covered under clause h suppose i destroy delete or alter any information which is available in the system or i do anything with which the value of that information gets lost after hacking i gets attracted and uh, under clause j suppose i alter or manipulate or steal or conceal computer source code of a computer after hacking so i can be dealt under such under clause j so therefore you can see that section 43 is wide enough to cover various forms of cyber crimes including those which can follow up the offense of hacking clause j however is all about hacking per se uh they use various terms like computer database getting affected and all and if you further look into the definition of computer database it is a wider definition given to include any information that is there on a computer which is processed on a computer which is uh, available in form of text image audio video etc so it's a very very wider definition so after hacking your system suppose i manipulate a audio file video file etc so computer database is a term that's used with reference to this and accordingly other clauses of the section will apply uh, so this is how the section is wider the only same clause as i said is that unless the uh, act is done uh, and, uh, with uh, dishonest or fraudulent intent it's not criminalized but uh, it is a matter of concern that it is still something which can attract civil liability under section 43 This section becomes more wider because of the terms used in uh, these sections. It is whoever, without consent or uh, authorization, accesses. Now, what is access? Is defined under Section Two A of the IT Act as, with its grammatical variations and cognate expressions, it means gaining access into or instructing or communicating with logical, arithmetic, or memory functions. or resources of a computer computer system computer network so basically i don't have to actually gain access into your system access over here would mean even communicating with your device without your consent so therefore that is also covered under this section uh then when you look at the definition of computers and all it is very very wide it also includes a term called communication device this is with reference to mobile phones etc any other personal digital devices which are helpfully communicating with another person if you look at the definition of computer it's quite wide as i just said it includes this is the definition given under section 2 i of the it act it says it includes any electronic magnetic optical or other high speed data processing device or system which per performs logical arithmetic memory functions by manipulations of electronic magnetic or optical impulses and then you can see it's more wider because of the second part of the definition it says it also includes all input output processing storage computer software and communication facilities that are connected or related to computer so thereby it's wide enough to include smartphones communication devices or even any input device output device processing devices storage devices like say hard disk etc so any of this if it is accessed without your permission can be termed as an offense under section 43 clause a uh, computer network is another term used under section 43 and this includes you uh, know all those computers which are connected with each other so it can be like in an office setup or you know uh, personal uh, systems if you take reference to uh, uh, it would include like say if your smartphone is connected with your say email account it's also connected with your say home appliances the smart devices or if it's connected with your laptop if it's connected as i said earlier home appliances suppose you are able to control your 
home appliances through your mobile phone. So these are all said to be computer networks. So if I hack your mobile phone is also hacking, if I gain access into that smart devices that you have in your home, like say smart television or refrigerator, etc. So that is also hacking under these provisions. Hacking can also be with reference to computer resource and computer resource under section 2K is defined as computer communication device, computer system, computer network. And if you see, it's very, very elaborate enough even to include data. So just gaining access into your uh, data itself is enough to make out the offense of, say, illegal access under 43, because this is how the term is defined. Similar is also the uh, issue with a computer system as a term. So again, a very, very widely defined term, which includes import and output devices. So basically, hacking would mean hacking a computer, computer system, computer network, computer resource. And these further includes all those devices which are used for processing data, storing information, etc thereby also attracting under its ambit many devices like IOTs, you know, Internet of Things, or like, you know, smart devices, like smart televisions, etc. Suppose I hack, say, a normal computer, so 43 and 66 gets attracted. Now, what if that computer is used for, say, delivering some extremely important service to citizens, and it's used by the government? So should we also bring it under Section 43? If you bring it under 43, it's fine, but then extent of liability may not be you know, uh, proportionate enough to the danger that I cause when I hack a system which is used to provide essential services, right? So keeping this in mind, so the law uh, you know, recognizes those systems which are used for critical infrastructure. And uh, this is done through Section 70. Section 70 of the IT Act says that the appropriate government, which can either be central or the state government, through notification can declare any computer resource which directly or indirectly affects the facility of critical information infrastructure as a protected computer. So through an official gets a notification, government can declare a particular system as a protected system, provided that system is the one through which critical information infrastructure is facilitated. But the question is, what is critical information infrastructure? This is defined through the statutory provision to this particular section, according to which it is um, uh, it includes this computer resource, the incapacitation or destruction of which shall have debilitating impact upon national security, economy, public health or safety. So you can again say this is an, another wider definition we have. So any system which you feel, you know, the hacker gains access into it, it raises the question of national security or it can affect the economy or it can affect the public health. And today public health related data is all collected by the state. Now what if it is stored in a device and somebody hacks it? So if that system is declared as a protected system, so then of course, Section 70 will come into picture or anything that raises the concerns of, say, online safety, etc. So how does this system get itself declared as protected computer? This can only happen provided you have a official gazette notification issued by one of the government central or the state. Um, now, what if once a system is declared as protected system, so what is the legal protection that is guaranteed with it? So subsection 2 of section 70 says that if a person has to gain access into these com protected computers, he should have authority to do this. And it should be a clear authority issued to him by the government agency. So which means IOU, if at all we had such system, it will be seen as an offense, not just under 43 or 66, but will be seen as an offense under section 70. Because if you see the very next subsection, it says any person who secures access or attempts to secure access into these kind of systems, which are declared as protected systems, um, so he, uh, or like he accesses it in contravention of the permission. Like I allow you to only see so-and-so folders, but you also gain access into the folders to which you do not have permission. So then it becomes an offense under section 70. And uh, under section 66, hacking of any computer is subject to criminal liability in form of imprisonment, which can go up to three years. While hacking a protected computer, the extent of punishment is huge compared to six, section 66 and over here, the imprisonment can go up to 10 years. Now, how does this matter? Procedurally, it has a lot of relevance. The IP Act says that any offense punishable with imprisonment up to three years or more than three years are cognizable in nature. They're non-bailable and they're non, sorry, up to three years or more than three years, they're cognizable, but they're bailable and they're compoundable, which means 
you know, to an extent, they increase the seriousness by declaring it as cognizable offense, but they reduce the seriousness by saying that this is bailable, it's compoundable. But when it comes to protected computer, which is punishable with 10 years imprisonment, so the yeah, same idea exists. If it's punishable with more than three years, it's not just cognizable, it's non bailable and non compoundable. So therefore, it becomes a very serious offense. In addition to this, it's interesting to note that Section 66F of the IT Act, capital F of the IT Act, which defines cyber terrorism and is also wide enough to include acts of cyber warfare, also says that if any person does any cyber security related attacks on a computer which is declared as a protected computer, he can even be booked under 66F. So which means if I hack a protected computer, I just do not fall under the ambit of section 17, it will automatically also be a case under section 66F, which is about cyber terrorism and cyber warfare. And we all know once terrorism law is invoked, you know, there are many other anti-terror laws like UAP Act, etc. We also come into picture, thereby again further increasing the seriousness of the offense. So thereby on the whole, uh, any manipulations, any illegal access into a protected system will usually be seen as an offense. You know, in relation to uh, terrorism. Um, so when it comes to protected computers, since these are extremely important, they have to do with critical infrastructure, etc. So there's a separate set of rules that are laid down under the IT Act, which talks about security practice and procedure one should follow if he's handling a protected computer. So this is an extremely a good provision when it comes to say uh, securing the protected system but this is hardly no provision because not many computers as on today are declared as protected computers so unless you officially declare it through notification this section will not have its applicability now so coming to this whole question of ethical hackers and all should they be liable or not is the question especially those you know who are only trying to show vulnerability in a system you know maybe i am genuinely trying to show that this particular system used for say uh, storing aadhaar details or particular system which is used by a nationalized bank maybe is not secure enough so i just want to show the vulnerability but can you hold me liable under the law as of now the law is so widely worded that you know yes i can be held liable because 43 is so widely worded it. So at least civil liability is a possibility. Criminal liability, though we say fraudulently, dishonestly, is a saving clause, is a safeguard. But if you further look into the definition of, say, dishonestly, it is further defined as something which includes either causing wrongful loss to another person or gaining something wrongfully. Now, when I hack a system only to show, show vulnerability in a system, maybe that's the object. But because of that, if at all your data's confidentiality is lost, or because of that, maybe there's some financial loss, etc., that you suffer. It can be definitely argued that you know there's a wrongful loss that the victim has suffered. So that can be the possible interpretation, though we haven't come across any such cases as of now, but it's possible. So therefore, showing vulnerability and all may not be something that can get legal immunity, at least as on today. But when it comes to see somebody who's hacking only to help a police officer, to help in a criminal process, etc. So that is not per se exempted from liability under IP Act. But if we look at IPC, which talks about somebody who does an offense, you know, who does an act, you know, while discharging his duty, being bound under the law. So he's exempted from criminal liability. So anything that he does is not an offense. And you have another section which says anyone who assists a public servant who is discharging his duty, etc. So even they are not liable. So which means if it is an, an officer authorized under the law who is hacking or if a person is assisting an officer who is authorized under the law. So I'm only assisting as a hacker. So these two are exempted from liability. We can extend the IPC's general defenses you know, grounds to this scenario. So otherwise, as of now, the law is not very clear about when you can, you know, exempt a person from liability. So that's one gray area that we see in our law. While on the other hand, some of the countries have recognized, have legally recognized ethical hackers, especially you do have a system where you can, you know, avail the services of ethical hackers in the course of investigating a case, etc. Something like that has to expressly happen in our country, which is still not happening. But yes, between indirectly, some attempts have happened. For example, of recently, the Minister of Home Affairs has spoken about, say, volunteer service when it comes to, say, online safety of women and children and all. So there if somebody gets information about, say, 
sexually explicit material, etc., he can provide his volunteer service. I feel this is an indirect recognition of hackers who might use this skill you know, to protect women or children on online spaces. This is not the exact express interpretation, but it's possible to include that uh, kind of a scenario. So otherwise, nowadays, some state polices have started using the services of ethical hackers. So this has informally started, but formally, we need a clearer provision when it comes to say, exempting somebody from the liability. So as known today, we can say that unless you're authorized by a law or a legally authorized person to gain access into a system, you shouldn't be doing it. Or unless the owner of the system or the person authorized to provide such uh, you know, uh, consent or in relation to a computer. So unless he has consented, every act of hacking is hacking under IT Act and it invites legal liability. There are a couple of cases, not many, but a couple of low court judgments, you know, which have come under Section 66, where criminal liability has been imposed upon hackers. So this is a case where the hacker, you know, uh, uh, was NG Arun Kumar. He was one of the employee of the uh, uh, company, which means he had un uh, he had access, you know, which was authorized. Uh, to an extent, but then he, you know, surpasses this authority and gains access into those files and systems to which he did not have exact authority. So upon the complaint being filed by uh, the uh, uh, Press Information Bureau, so the matter was investigated by CBI and that later led to conviction by the Magistrate Court. So like that, you do have some low court decisions, so not many precedents have been set with regard to the uh, section 43 or 66, so maybe it's a long way to go, especially when it comes to say ethical hackers and all law is still unclear. Today, the other concern has been that of smart devices that we have in our house in form of, as I was mentioning earlier, telephones, refrigerators, washing machines, you know, any other smart device that can be accessed through digital devices, through cyber technology. Now, what if that is hacked and you do not realize that you're being hacked? So they, you know, raises the question of security, and uh, you know uh, uh, of the uh, devices and the people associated with those devices. So law is also not again clear as to how this should be tackled. Of course, when it comes to investigation or trial and all, we do have other challenges that affects implementation of this so-called wide law. Uh, and that challenge you know, uh, comes up in form of jurisdiction, in form of anonymity that the hacker gets, and in form of, uh, say, uh, technicality that the case involves. And many times, it's a huge challenge to the investigating agency. You know, how do they investigate these cases and all? Many times, maybe the victim is hacked, but he doesn't even realize that he's being hacked because, you know, unless he hacker does something suspicious, how will you even know that somebody has hacked your device? So that's the concern. And today, another important concern is that every act of hacking raises the question of data protection, privacy protection. So it needs to be taken more seriously. And as I said earlier, ethical hackers liability needs to be uh, you know, clarified. So in this regard, amendments to the law is expected. Uh, what if somebody is officially using that ethical hacker service? Of course, they deserve exemption from liability because they do possess with them this extremely uh, important, valuable skill and expertise, which many times is essential, especially when you're investigating a case or trying to prevent a crime from getting committed, etc. So law, therefore, should address the two concerns. When it comes to imposing liability, there's a lot of challenge that uh, the uh, law enforcement agency face. And that needs to be taken care of. And when it comes to hackers who are ethically using it, who are actually white hat hackers, their protection uh, is essential. And that's where immunity should be more expressly and explicitly provided. So there are any questions we can take up. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. So it was quite an engaging session. And <clears throat> to juxtapose IT Act and the different facets, especially to, of the hackers, including the criminal law. And more so, I think a lot of people would learn that for the first time that uh, it has this liability under the civil as well as the criminal. Normally, one doesn't believe that. I would say as to whether we have any questions. It's not on this group, but I will see as to whether we have on the Facebook. 
Bakalım hazırlanır. Right. So there's a question yeah. about one, one Rajit has posted a question, ma'am. Right. Yeah, I just read that, sir. So uh, scammers were running phishing attacks all over the world, and India is also victim. And why you know we are not able to solve this? As I just mentioned very briefly at the end, so this raises a lot of challenges. So one is that technical nature of the offense. So uh, an IBO should be trained to handle this entire issue, both from technical as well as legal perspective. So what we require here is techno legal, you know, knowledge. Especially the investigating agencies should be aware of this. Uh, so that's one thing. And then, especially if you just look at hacking as an offense, so you know, you need a lot of details to even proceed with the investigation. Login details. Who's the one who's authorized to you know, uh, you know maintain this? You know, it's supposed to provide all this to the police. So many times, victim may not have this. So this is just an example of how, like, technically, it becomes extremely difficult task for the investigating officers. Uh, second question is that of jurisdiction. So we have wider provisions under IT Act which says offense committed by an Indian or in India, or if it's committed in relation to a computer, computer system, computer network located in India, we we'll have jurisdiction. So theoretically, we have wider provisions with which you can invoke jurisdiction. But practically, the whole difficulty of, say, collecting evidence from abroad, so you all know like, how difficult it is even to get this you know, data from another country, especially when you have servers located elsewhere, or especially when you have like you know all those data located on a cloud, you know, again, the server of which is probably not in India. So that cooperation and coordination between different agencies across the country is difficult. Not just that, even within India, suppose it's an issue which needs to be investigated by, say, by Kanaka police, and they'll have to collect evidence from, say, uh, Punjab police. So there are also a lot of procedural hurdles on it. So one is that jurisdiction is a challenge, you know, even within the state and within the nation also. So, so like this, there are many problems that are associated with regard to the implementation of the law. Uh, and then... Um, Beyond all this, you might get information, but that information should be in form of legally accepted evidence, right? So therefore that legal procedure, especially compliance to CRPC, compliance to the principles of say evidence learned on, you know, adds on to the challenge. Just to give another example, so you need 65B certificate when you do computer output as an evidence and every cyber crime involves such an evidence. So when you don't have that certificate, you may not be able to you know, get uh, admissibility to that evidence. So there are a lot of associated challenges. So that's another issue. Uh, this is by uh, IT Act has become one of the method of lodging matrimonial cases. Are there any checks and balances not to use criminal law where the matters are civil? That's a general sweeping statement. So we're yes, not taking this question. Uh, whether it is matrimonial it. or not, so maybe uh, you know sometimes we do see that in family matters there's allegation of hacking of spouse email IDs or you know email accounts or Facebook accounts etc. I think it should be independently seen. The reason why I hack my spouse email you know account or his you know social media account uh, can't be to get some evidence for my matrimonial case. But the fact that I hack can't be say this through. And um, so would the relationship matter here? I don't think so. So there's an interesting judgment that you know is reminded through you know by this question. So the uh, where do you, before that, so where do you find the civil case? is an important question that needs to be answered. So the cases under 43 should be filed before adjudicating officer who's appointed under the IT Act. And who's this adjudicating officer? He is an IS rank officer. He's the secretary to IT and DP department, information technology department. So in one of the case, it was similar to this. It was about, say, maintenance petition, which was filed by the wife against the husband to prove his financial status and all. She uh, gets the copy of the husband's bank account details and produces this as an evidence before the adjudicating authority. Uh, sorry, before the concerned family courts. So then the husband files a case against her and the bank manager before adjudicating authority, alleging, say, breach of privacy and all. Uh, so that's when the adjudicating of authority says that, yes, this is breach of, uh, say, privacy, because like 43, you have another section, 43A, which is about um, uh, imposing liability upon the companies or the persons who are handling sensitive information or personal information and they breach this privacy by not taking care of due safety, say, you know, due uh, 
uh, diligence, etc. So the manager was made to pay compensation to the husband. Why is the court says is also you know a wrongdoer, but then looking at the nature of relationship, she was not asked to pay any compensation. So this case is an indication that between relationships also you know these kind of issues can crop up tomorrow. And of course, hacking is hacking, as I said, irrespective of your motive, unless the law itself exempts so and so from liability and all. It is definitely an offence, and today that's the mode through which people are getting evidences and all. Of course, tomorrow it will become a huge issue. We've had occasions when courts have even like um, warned lawyers uh, when they've got illegal access to say call data records and also because privacy is also an important issue today. And post put this for me judgment, I know it's become an extremely important issue. So irrespective of the motive, hacking is hacking. Data intrusion is data intrusion. Privacy breach is privacy breach. Yeah, this is by Abhishek. Uh, there are two interwoven questions by him. Do you think artificial intelligence and IoT has a vast technology in it uh, that will self-develop in future, which can prove as a boon or a curse? Which one, according to you? I think it's just like cyber technology. It's advantages as well as disadvantages. So that's how I started the talk. So same. And it goes through with uh, no any other versions of this technology, artificial intelligence or IoT. Of course, they are boon because you know they give you a lot of convenience and comforts and all. It's advantages for uh, you know many uh, purposes for various reasons and all. At the same time, it, if it is misused, if the technology is misused, it is definitely disadvantages. So it, it is just like. You know, the other forms of cyber technology. So therefore, um, the law and then the entire like, you know, effort should be towards promoting the expansion of this technology at the same time, curbing the menace you know, that can be created because of abuse of this technology. And that's where I think as of now, there is a lack of certainty in the law and that needs to be taken care of uh, you know, uh, uh, by the lawmakers, at least in future. So it, it is just like what I'm reminded of. It says, you may hate me, you may like me, but you can't ignore me. Same as with the technology. Exactly, sir. Definitely. And it is also a popular saying which says, you know, uh, technology can be a better servant, but a worse master. So let's let this technology expand as long as it is advantageous. But too much of a dependence on this technology for anything or everything might prove to be, you know, a bad tomorrow. But we have to see how it explodes itself in future. Yeah. I think. This is why Dr. Narendran, ma'am. Just, just see that. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. During forensic investigation, an expert, that is an ethical hacker, is limited to hack the accused computer device to obtain a particular evidence alone. But sometimes there are possibilities to capture additional evidence too. In this scenario, is an expert having provision to submit the evidence or is it a criminal offense in the IT Act in case the expert doesn't share the evidence? So, uh, I couldn't understand the next, second part of the uh, question, but I just take it like this. So in the course of investigation, I'm authorized to access a particular data. But apart from that, I also get access to other data, which I was not supposed to have you know, gained access to. So the very nature of device is such that demarcating becomes extremely difficult. It's like, you know, just not possible, actually not possible. But as long as I do not disclose it elsewhere and all, so as long as I'm complying with privacy requirements and all is fine. For example, we have section 72 of the IP Act, which says that any person while you know who is authorized under the law while discharging his duty comes across some data, some information, etc., the confidentiality of which he should maintain, but he doesn't maintain. So then he is liable. So we already have a section which says that you were authorized to access, but then you know you should have maintained the confidentiality of it. You don't maintain, then you're liable under 72. So that's first thing. Secondly, what if while investigating or otherwise, I gain access to a data which is which I feel you know needs to be disclosed to law enforcement agency in order to prevent some other crime or in order to be used you know for uh, punishing a particular offense, etc. See, as long as it is to help the law enforcement agency or giving it to the lawful authorities, I think you'll again get protection in one or the other form, including by invoking the provisions of IPC while assisting a law, you know, a legally bound officer, while assisting a public servant, so those things. But 
who do I disclose? When do I disclose? What do I disclose matters? So instead of disclosing it to the police, what if I go and disclose it to the media? So that's when I'm breaching privacy, right? So therefore, the law is quite reasonable enough to take care of this concern. One is if you accidentally come across information that you shouldn't have is okay because you require that, uh, you know, mens rea to attract liability under 66. Secondly, after gaining access to it, what do I do would also matter. So I don't like disclose it to anyone, including media, not liable. I disclose it to the police thinking that it's important to be disclosed to prevent a crime, etc. is fine. I disclose it to media you know, or anybody else or a third party. So that's when privacy law gets attracted, including section 72. So, ma'am, we have no other question, uh, and uh, we have. I'm quite sure that all those participants would have understood the concept of hacking and liabilities under the law. And on behalf of all those participants who have been watching us live on the Facebook, YouTube, and this platform, we thank you for sharing your knowledge as well as time. And tomorrow, friends, the session would be on can two Indian parties choose a foreign seat as an arbitration of arbitration? This is by Ajay Thomas the independent arbitrator and member ICC commissions on arbitration and ADR. And he already had one webinar last week. So do stay connected with us. Everyone stay safe, stay blessed. And thank you to everyone.